Okay, so before I start my day here, <laughs> I thought I'd do this at least once today, okay? Because we're only on page, oh my lord, number 11. <clears throat> and it's June 17th of 2023. <clears throat> now, I think this video, I got I got some water boiling. I got to give up coffee, really, but not today. Okay, so <clears throat> when my water's boiling, I'm going to go get my coffee, okay? I'm just, I was up late last night, and I slept in late, and I just did the eye drops, and oh my god. Okay, so I think I'm going to call this video, Looking for Clues. Yeah, I think so. Because, you know, as I'm reading this, right, new things are coming from the bottom up that back in those days wasn't even aware of. Okay, I can't be specific as to exactly what I was, whoa, yeah, right, now all this time has passed and it, it's really starting to make sense in regards to, you know, what the cops did and what the cops didn't do, okay? So, we're looking for clues, right? You know, it's, it's it, there's, we know there's more than one needle in the haystack, Okay. We know that some of these needles and these clues, they just find their way to their destination to provide, you know, that torch, the light, right, the truth, right, <clears throat> to connect the dots so that uh, we can take a, tra a tragedy, we can take a tragedy and perhaps prevent other un needless deaths that are very harmful to families and destroy lives, right? And hold our governments to account. We have to find a way to start holding our governments to account and their uh, employees when it relates to the public union sector wherever it branches out to, right? Listening, listening to my water. So, with that said, we're going to pick up where I left off, and I'm going to read until I just, you know how it goes, right? Two hours later, I'm like, whoa, that's probably enough for this video. And then, at some point later on, <coughs> after all these videos are done, <coughs> and assuming I can still see, um, what do you call it? I'll go back in and I'll run a string of them and then I'll just go from video to video to video and just put the, the, the string of links to the videos for this particular subject into the description box, box from video to video to video. So for people that are coming in new, you know, you if, if I don't give you at least a previous video, you know, when you're getting into the thousands of videos and you don't, like me, put your stuff in a playlist, these will get lost and buried until such time I put them in a playlist and we don't know when that's going to happen. So in the meantime, I'm just putting previous video. So in the description link, it will be the previous video to this video if you're just coming into this video because all of a sudden it popped up on the YouTube feed and, you know, you're coming in halfway through the story. Right? I'm just saying. Okay, whatever. Is my water boiling yet? Yes, it is. Can you pour that for me and maybe bring it to me oh, so I don't have to get up and turn off the camera just yet? Where is it? Oh, is it this cup that has that milk? Yes, it is. Okay. Okay, now, in light of looking for clues before I start, because we know going down memory lane. Do you want me to add No. Sugar? Oh, no. I, don't, I don't know if I add sugar in it. Just hold on a minute. Okay, so before we start, I would like to touch base with some of these women that are listening to this and trying to understand, right? You know, everybody um, internalizes, I'm sorry about this glare, that's because my chandelier is hanging up behind me. Everybody internalizes information differently. 
you know. So anyway, this is a valid point. It's not the first time somebody's brought it up. So before we get on with other stuff, let's talk about just a couple of key points here. Right? Now, I am going out of my way to... Uh, I'm trying to set up my glasses here, people. Okay, hold on. It is what it is. Uh, let's see, did I answer this one? What is this? One day ago. Oh, I didn't see this. Because I always give hearts, right? Very seldom do I not. Oh, that's mine. I repost. Sometimes I repost because... Oops. Sometimes I repost. This is what, this is what Liliana said and then I came and I answered right but sometimes when people you know close their accounts or something those posts would disappear so this is why I copy and paste so that if for any reason Liliana closes her account the post still remains because the information is important okay that if you're wondering why I do that or sometimes I get a troll alert and I'll copy and paste a troll alert before I uh see she got hurt Here's the post, okay? So, basically, in this post here, uh, did Shimei ever think to take steps to getting a restraining order against Julian? I know that it's not going to stop anyone from ultimately doing what they set out to do. My first husband told me many times that a piece of paper would not stop him and that I'd be gone long I'd be gone long before the cops could get to me and this is true this is what women face sorry wandering eye right okay he was a very violent man what did help me at one point was the paper trail the report that had been filed the one time I actually spoke to authorities about his abuse. I was sorry, it's my eyes, okay? Sometimes that's all we can do. All right, so you have to just remember families are set up, families that are targeted. Not everybody's targeted, okay? Some people are more insulated and are more protected for whatever reason. Of course, some families are of criminal mind. And then other families are more vulnerable and become the targeted family. They only need 10% of the population to do what they do in order to amass great wealth. Okay? It doesn't matter what, what, what part of the population. It doesn't matter if it's the old people stealing their houses or if it's the young people stealing their bodies. Okay, I've said this before. All right. So, in our situation, because of the drama and trauma that we had with Sierra since the age of, well, you could say, well, it started in 13, but, you know, cops, I called cops when she was 14 to get her out of that woman's house that was feeding her methamphetamine, and the police said, no, we can't take her out of the house because she's 14 years old, and she's old enough to make her own decisions under the Criminal Code of Canada, so therefore we're not taking her out which, you know, in essence, just reinforced the, the drug abuse. It turned her into an addict even more. They should have intervened, taken her out of that house and put her in some sort of a, I don't know, rehab center, being that she was already 14 years old and addicted to methamphetamine. But that wasn't the long-term plan, okay? That wasn't the long-term plan. The long-term plan was to have her keep doing drugs, fill that, underground economy in terms of you know the money that's being filtered through that and then have her you know go through the period of go running around out in the streets acting like a little hoodlum stealing people's purses doing all that crap so they can hook them up into the justice system to prop up that portfolio within the government and their budget 
right? We know how that goes, people, right? And then they filter them off at age 16, 17 to tr keep them safe, and they put them somewhere else and separate them from the home because obviously the problem is in the home when, in fact, it's in the community. Okay, so, all right. And then, you know, for the longest time, Sierra said, oh, I'll never be a prostitute. I'll never be a prostitute. And, and she wasn't, and she didn't want to be and had no inclination to be. But we know... We know it's just a matter of time before these individuals, young people, male and female, because it's not just women falling through the cracks here, okay? It's men too, right? Young men. You know, once they get onto that bandwagon, and then they get into the age, you know, anywhere from, well, yeah, you can get teenage prostitutes, but, you know, if they're, if they're, if they're bucking the bullet and they're trying to avoid it, they'll go with the thieving first to, to support the habit as the, commun as the handlers in the community are keeping them out on the streets, right? And making it really hard for parents to parent their children and put them back on the straight path, okay? And, and as that's all happening, you're coming into contact sooner or later at one point or another with police. So the police were established in the household as at an early age because of this dysfunction of Sierra. This is what I'm, of Sierra, this is what I'm trying to say. So, you know, and then by the time she turned, oh, geez. I don't know, 20, something like that. It wasn't like she could run around stealing purses out in the streets like when she was 14 years old under the loving watch of Norma, the one that was feeding my daughter methamphetamine and the cops wouldn't take out of her house. <laughs> and then, you know, now she's in a different crowd of handlers that want to keep her out on the street. So in those days, I used to go out with my car, literally people, and, you know, my son, Brooks, or whoever, and we take her off the streets, put her in the car and bring her home, bring her in the house, and then sooner or later she'd find a way to dash off and go off and do it again, because she was under that mind control as being manipulated with the drugs. Okay, and then by this time she's on heroin, and then I learned about the methadone, then I tried to get her on the methadone, I've said this before, nothing, it didn't stick until finally she got pregnant, and then of course she's still being pimped out on the streets, right, but she's coming here and she's saying, mom, you know, like, you know, I'm pregnant, and, you know, they want me to have an abortion. Everybody's telling me to have an abortion, and I'm like, no, Sierra, no, 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 it's okay. You don't need to worry, you know, just, you need to get on the methadone, and blah, 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 and it's okay. She took a chance, got on the methadone. Everything was working good. She moved into the house. Even at one point, she went up into the interior with a church group that had her out in a little farm and that's where she learned how to do a lot of farming and flowers and planting garlic and she's in the, under the sun with a big belly big smile on her face with these women and everything was good and then she came back and you know she was on the methadone and she moved into the house and she had the baby and but you know for whatever reason MCFD the social workers you know they wanted her to move. I know, it's not this, okay, but it's, this all relates, right, as to why we ourselves didn't call the cops on Julian each and every time. And I don't think we ever called the cops on Julian because we didn't want to recreate the wheel like we had with Sierra. Because after Sierra had um, Andre, you know, of course, Austin was in the house because they were a couple and MCFD social workers with their Family Preservation Society which was a nonprofit group working with Andre shut up with Ministry of Children and Family Development to preserve families they were like trying to get Sierra and Austin to move out of here with the baby as a newborn as a newborn people into a basement suite and this guy had a history of choking the shit out of her until she actually passed out and beating her up and all this crap I couldn't I just for the life of me I couldn't and that's when I had to start to fight against that 
and filing complaints against the family preservation, the, fa the preservation family center, and, you know, and filing complaints against the social workers that were trying to get this shit to happen. And, you know, they were calling us in for meetings to make the plan and just, oh, it was just awful. And of course, with Sierra and Austin fighting, you know, the cops would come or whatever. Like one time, Sierra left. She had to go off and do something. She had an appointment or something. And I went downstairs and the baby was crying. And Austin had the baby. And I, went, I took the baby. I came upstairs and he started raging. And then I don't know, somehow the cops showed up. And, you know, and just, oh, it was just fucking drama. So, you know, drama after drama after drama over a period of years, you get to the point where you just don't want anything to do with social workers. You don't want anything to do with fucking cops. Nothing, right? So, Austin left. Everything was fine. Everything calmed down. You know, Joan was a bit of a troublemaker, Uncle John's wife. You know, whatever. You know, the house wasn't conducive to the size of the family. Landlord, it took three years, people, to fix the basement bathroom for crying out loud. I got freaking videos on that because you know, I was expected to go out onto the fucking homeless shelter and get homeless people to work in the bathroom, to fix the bathroom so my landlady could, 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 what do you call that? Save money. And, of course, nothing ever really got fixed correctly. One guy went in there, did this, did that, whatever. And then it all had to be ripped up and taken out and redone again. And then my bathroom, below the bathroom, right? Bathroom to bathroom. My toilet, some, some sort of something, I don't know what the hell it was, broke. And it started leaking every time you flush the fucking toilet. And, it's, and it started leaking on the on the ceiling that was right under the shower and it got all gross and it's not fixing it people so of course people are freaking fighting it's like Uncle John said not fixing anything to keep it fucking fighting so it's not just the cops okay whatever a leaky boat is better than no boat right alright so anyway and then you know they kicked her out right out of the blue in the middle of winter for not coming home so there's you know right within 10 days somebody injects her and that's not in Sierra's medical files they got it listed down that she was injecting drugs that's a bunch of fucking crock Sierra was so proud that she never injected drugs through all the shit that she went through and put us through that was the one thing I'll never inject drugs mom I'll never I'm so proud I'm never and I'm not like those other people you know blah whatever but anyway 10 days of, shut up Andre 10 days of after being disconnected from the methadone somebody did that for her and that was it people that was it. You know, just bring in the cops. Then she'd come to the house. You know, we'd come outside. There she's half dead, lying in the freaking garage. What you gonna do? Call 911. So you got a whole bunch of paramedics running around, cops running around. And this went on for years. Okay? 2018, I finally freaking got her a house. Okay? They kicked her out in December of 2012. It took me till 2018 to get that little shack over there, that little house, right? The little house that the, 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 the people that moved in from the streets turned it into a freaking mutiny, right? I got that house for Sierra to get her off the streets, people. As that landlord, that Punjabi, had it on lockdown for nine months, price gouging, the poorest of the poor. He wanted $1,900 for a fucking little shack, little little rancher, you know, that he was going to tear down just so he could throw everybody back out onto the streets. And his plumbing was leaking all over the place. He didn't give a damn because he, he knew he was going to tear down the house. And, uh, and because it was $1,900 and the welfare was only giving them $375 per person for rent, you had to stack and pack them in there. And you're dealing with people with, you know, drug addiction and mental illness. Either or, it was a roof over Sierra's head. Okay? But still, house came to an end, threw her out. Well, the people in the house, in the end, threw her out. Because they took it over and turned it into a fucking shack. Right? The Syrian that likes to go next door on his mo little maroon moped. Yeah, okay. I mean, go into my videos and hear that story. Right? 
Frenchy. No, you're not French. You're Syrian. You came to fucking Canada to start selling drugs and go on welfare because you're so disabled because you came from a war-torn country. Well, welcome to fucking the new Congo, Canada. But he's the drug dealer, so I guess it's okay. Right. You come to my country to sell drugs to kill my family. Yeah, okay. So that you can take my house. Okay. Basically. All right, don't get mad. So, so you know, like over, like from 2012, right up until she died, basically, but Shemay died in April of 2018, so 2012, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, okay, up until the April of 2018, it was nothing but drama with Sierra, right? The kids would let her in downstairs, right? Andre was upstairs. I know it's independent suite down there. You know, she's living in my fucking garage. Kids walking by. They can't have that. That's her sister. So they let her try to come back in, right? Okay? And, and, and what? They, they go to the bathroom and there's Sierra in the bathtub. So, what? 911 is called. Oh, here comes the cops. Here comes the paramedics. You know, we went through that so many times. Or go into the kitchen, Right? Okay, so you call the 911, right? Or it got to the point where they didn't want her here anymore because, you know, it was always ending up to be like this. You didn't know when you were going to find Sierra dead. That's how serious this shit was. For crying out loud, she came up here one time, went to, like, you know, she was gone, and she, and she just showed up, and she was at my, my door, but we'd already gone through, like, 15 times with cops in the last seven months. You know, in and out, in and out, in and out, in and out, right? You know, right? From Because, you know, she lived in a laundry room for crying out, people. The, 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 the kids let her go in and live in the living room. And I don't know, she just couldn't stop the fucking drugs. I don't know what the hell, because she was doing this. And she was rebelling. And they got tired of finding her half dead. It scared them too many times. But even then, in the middle of winter, the government never housed her. They never got her subsidized. They never got. They never did nothing to her. So she'd always come back here. I go downstairs and there's Sierra in the in the, in the laundry room. I'm asking the kids, "What the hell's going on?" Oh, well, we let Sierra you now stay in the laundry room because it's too cold cold outside, Mom. She won't go away. Oh, okay. Well, at least I can think that she's warm, right? She got water. If she needs the bathroom, all she has to do is ask. Right? I can't tell my kids to let her be in there knowing what she's been doing. Right? I'm glad that they're at least letting her do that because we're all feeling like shit. But that's the game, people. You see, that's the game. Right? If you don't call the cops, you get into trouble. If you call the cops, you get into trouble. Okay, so, all right, whatever. And then, uh, you know, now Shemay's finding herself in a similar situation like Sierra was with Austin. Okay? Julian had his issues before Shemay got pregnant. But they got worse a thousandfold the minute she got pregnant, and he really, 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 really became very, very, very violent and extreme. Because he felt safe once he knew that she was going to keep it. And he terrorized us. And he threatened us. And he did stupid shit to show us that he was serious terms of punching holes in walls, bang, busting out doors, s smashing windows, flipping fucking furniture, just whatever, okay? Making threats, whatever, okay? The last thing we wanted to do was call the cops and repeat the process like we went through with Sierra. Because once you start doing that and you got children in the house, what happens? No, the social workers, they just want the kids because it props up their fucking portfolio and their friends within the foster care system and their research studies and this and that, not to mention for the ones that just disappear and are never found again. Or suddenly die in the ministry of the, in the in the care of the ministry of children and family development as if you're going to find out to the truth as to why they died mothers come and find out that their children died in foster care and are told well that's just too bad that you'll never know why because it's under the freedom of information where we've locked it under key where you just don't have the right to know <laughs> so but because he always left before it got to that point 
or Brooks would shoo him away, or my son was patrolling the yard. We never called. We wanted to, but we were afraid to because of what we went through with Sierra and how they used their sickness against us to control us so that they could exploit us. They are the ones that created Sierra. They are the ones that kept her out there. They are the ones that unleashed a monster into the community. And that monster kept coming home. <clears throat> and then we had to deal with the monster. And there were times we had to call the police or the ambulance to intervene. Otherwise, who knows what would have happened. So when Julian, and, he, and Julian knew this, you see, that's, Andre, shut up! Go away! Go somewhere else! There's nowhere else for me to go. Julian knew this. I'll talk quiet, okay? Yeah, because he's seen what was going on with Sierra. And he used it to his advantage. But it's like Liliana says, even if we would have documented each and every incident with Julian, it wouldn't have stopped him. <coughs> Especially knowing what I know now with the fact that he was working with the police. <coughs> Jul Shimei wasn't the first and last person Julie, Julian was involved with when it came to a dead body. Okay, so th that's why we didn't call, because of all the trauma and the drama basically around Sierra, and we were petrified to recreate the wheel because of an idiot named Julian. It was enough that we had to go through it with Austin. Right? <coughs> and then... It was enough that they turned Sierra into a junkie, and then we were just going through that shit week after week after week after week after week after year after year after year after year. <coughs> okay? Why would we want to start calling the cops on Julian? We wouldn't. If we could scare him off on our own, that's what we did. So, does it make it right? Obviously not. But it shows you that the system is messed up. Okay? So when the government talks about, oh, well, you know, we put in $2.5 million into, you know, domestic violent programs and all this other crap, well, take it with a grain of salt. No, what they did is they took $2.5 million and they invested it into these family preservation societies and those kind of things that can needle vulnerable people to make bad choices to set them up for failure because if Sierra would have moved into a basement suite with Austin when Andre was a freaking newborn how long do you think that that would have lasted before they would have went in there and swooped him up at least staying with me she had 28 months of being a happy healthy mother to her child to whom she loved dearly but social services didn't like that and they ruined it and they left us with cops and the ambulance to solve the problem that they created when we couldn't solve the problem ourselves like I said, my kids let her move into the living room, but it didn't work. And then, you know, she had to leave. Eventually, she be coming still all the time, regularly, right? And, you know, so then they said, okay, when it got real cold, they let her freaking move into the bloody laundry room, people. And that's not, that's, that's not when, you know, like, even after they kicked her out, she was still going into her room. In, in 2012, with Shemay, which because Shemay had to come downstairs because I was I had to I had to prove to MCFD that I had a room for Andre before I could bring him back home after they took him from a fucking daycare, so I had to move Shemay downstairs. That was a turning point in Shemay's life, right? And she ended up in Sierra's room. 
and you, there's a video of that. And she's completely depressed because she's got Sierra coming in when Shemay's not there, moving back into her bed with Austin, leaving her drug paraphernalia around. Shemay comes back from school, doesn't want to be in that room, but doesn't have a choice because her room upstairs is sitting empty because we believe that the social workers are going to give us back Andre the next time we go to court, which is a bitch, bunch of freaking hogwash. Okay? I went to court 22 times in 15 months for Andre, people. That's a lot of times to go to court. And that room sat empty for 15 months. Well, Shemay sat in Sierra's room with Sierra trying to get back in there, thinking it was still her room, as she was completely fucked up with this shit now. On a rampage. So yeah, cops were being called all the time. And Julian knew it. When he came, started coming around. And he used it to his advantage. Because he knew that we didn't want to start that process all over again with him. Anyway, okay? Just saying. And then, she came back in today. What'd she say? No, this is some woman named Linda Waters. <clears throat> she popped up about a month ago. She says she's not a troll. So we got to give her the benefit of the doubt. <coughs> I'm just curious. You say that with fentanyl, the moment it touches you... Well, first of all, I never said that. Maybe in a past video I may have mentioned it. But anyway, she's got it confused with things that she's heard over the years with other people reporting on fentanyl that it's so toxic under certain circumstances that all you have to do is just touch it with the tip of your finger which is no bigger than a grain of salt when you touch whatever that is the fentanyl it can pass through your skin and kill you just like that well it depends on the type of fentanyl and the concentration of it because there's different types of fentanyl that have different analogs you've got the fentanyl the medical fentanyl you've got the street fentanyl, you've got the carfinol. The carfinol is for like elephants and that kind of thing, right? So they they have different analogs with different strengths. What's that? Kari. Oh, oh Tisha's here. You never told me we're I didn't know. I, I'm not, what's, why, why are you here? Freaking, you aren't answering the phone. I have a funeral to go to. You have a funeral to go to? Yeah. Where did that come out of? Alex's aunt died. I didn't tell you. But you weren't answering the phone. Where's the light mate? She's coming. Well, why do you spring this on me? You were answering the phone. No, I know, but didn't you have like a week notice to let me know that I... I didn't know. Oh, I was you didn't supposed know? to go to church today. Oh, you're supposed to go to church today. Oh. Uh, Tisha? Yeah. Now I want to give you a morning bath. I'll yeah, tomorrow. 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 Okay, I'm going to leave. Okay, I got a camera going. Okay. So what, are you leaving them both here? Yeah. Okay. Good, thank you. Alright, love you. Love you too. Okay. Alright, so... Yeah, come inside! <laughs> so anyway... I was informed by the coroner she may have had medical fentanyl. And it makes sense with the the nausea, the passing out, right, the dizziness, right, the wooziness over a period of a couple of days as she was smoking her smokes, okay, I doubt every cigarette was laced with medical fentanyl, but a large majority of them were, and because it's a drug that gets accumulated, right you know you, like it, it, it's a, like you know it's like a medication right so if it's a medical fentanyl you get your prescription with how, however many milligrams or whatever the doctor starts you off small you know and you take it every so many hours and then over a period of a couple of weeks or a month you your body now has established a tolerance 
and you're going to need a higher dose in order to get the same effect for whatever the doctor is treating. But if you're not on that regime, you, first of all, you, you wouldn't even know what it felt like if you never took fentanyl before. And she didn't take fentanyl, so how the hell would she know what it would feel like in terms of, ooh, I'm dizzy, or I'm feeling sick, or I'm getting sleepy, right? We just thought it was a flu, because it's insidious. But it was building up in her system, right? And, uh, you know, people that are on the streets and are using the street fentanyl, if they've been out on the streets for quite a long time and they're, you know, doing their fentanyl every day, doesn't matter the source of it on the street, their level of tolerance for it is high, right? But then if they get arrested and they go to jail and they're in jail for a couple of months and then they're released from jail and they get out on the streets and they buy their dope and it's laced with fentanyl, this is why the needle exchange was testing people's dope because, you know, people are being released from jail, they go off and get their dope, and if it's not tested for fentanyl, because they hadn't done any fentanyl for two months because they're in jail, the first hit, kill them. But if they had been out on the streets for two months doing that hit every day, it would be nothing. It'd be just business as usual, right? So, because medical fentanyl is pretty mild compared to street drugs, it was enough to make her just, to subdue her, to disarm her, to make her um, passive, make it so that, you know, she wasn't to react very quickly, to dumb her down, put her to sleep. <coughs> It was the morphine and the cocaine that, I don't know if it killed her because she was already in the death rattle. Tisha witnessed that. <clears throat> right? The, the morphine and the cocaine was put into her system via injection to make it look like she was doing drugs that were laced with fentanyl. Right? So that ultimately it was the fentanyl that was blamed for the death because the street, the drugs out here are laced with the fentanyl and everybody's blaming the fentanyl for the overdose. Doesn't matter if it's meth, if it was laced with fentanyl and they died, the fentanyl killed them, not the meth. It wouldn't matter if it was crack, if it was laced with fentanyl, street fentanyl, and they died, it was the fentanyl that killed them, not the crack and so on and so on and so on, right? The morphine and the cocaine was there just to make it look like she had done drugs at eight o'clock in the morning by herself in the living room and somehow, some way, it was laced with fentanyl. But as it turns out, it was laced with medical fentanyl, which, when you now look at the clues, makes sense. If you've never taken medical fentanyl before, you wouldn't know that you'd get dizzy with it. You wouldn't know that you would feel nauseated with it. You wouldn't know that you would just be sitting there and then all of a sudden just fall asleep. Okay? You wouldn't know. Unless, of course, you've already taken fentanyl, medical fentanyl, and you experienced those feelings in the initial stages of starting the drug. And even then, I don't... We don't know the dosage of the medical fentanyl that Shimei was smoking. We just know that it was a low dose compared to what's out on the streets when it comes to those analogs. Okay? So if she was smoking cigarette back to back that were laced with medical fentanyl, okay, the first smoke would maybe be a regular dose. But maybe she got nervous, Julian running around acting like a fucking idiot, who knows, or texting her or whatever, or she's stressing out about school, and she has a second cigarette within 20 minutes versus within three hours. Like, if you get, like, if you, if you get medical fentanyl with a prescription where your dosage is, like, every four hours, I have to take this four times a day, 
This is my one eye drop. I got to do four times a day. So I have to spread this out four times a day. I don't, I can't sit there and just go one, two, three, four because, right? I have to spread it out. Well, it's the same thing with medical fentanyl, right? If your doctor says you got to take four little pills within a space of 24 hours, you have to spread it out because if you start back to back to back, you know, you're, you're, sub, you're sub, subjecting yourself to harm and, and to potential death because you're overdosing with it. common sense right so when I put my mouth to Shimei there was no she wasn't smoking from a pipe like you know if you smoke a crack pipe right I'll give you an example when I had the little house and after Shimei died I was talking to all the addicts there with their different you know choice of drugs really kind of like you know picking their brains to understand how fentanyl works, right? With them out on the streets. And this one woman, she said to me, and she liked crack, right? There was heroin addicts there, there were methamphetamine addicts there, and there were crack addicts. Every Everybody has their ch choice of drugs, right? And this woman, she liked to smoke crack in a pipe, right? And she was there at the house because, you know, people were homeless. That was a safe haven for a lot of people. For the nine months I had it, people. Because the government is failing them. Anyway, she told me that in her little crack pipe, it was a bowl, a bowl, right? Not that long glass thing, but more like a pot pipe, pot glass pipe with a bowl. She said that, you know, she, she smoked her crack. Everything was fine. She went to sleep, she got up in the morning, she went and took a hoot, and she practically died. The only thing that saved her was somebody was around her when, when she just dropped. As soon as she took the hoot, she dropped instantly. Because there was a grain of fentanyl in the bowl that she hadn't smoked the night before. Because it was, you know, you have a, right? It was on the side of the bowl. But when she went and took a hoot in the morning, no. she said it was instant. Instant. Whereas Shmei was different. That was medical fentanyl. That either came from Julian's mother's house <clears throat> because Julian's mother is on fentanyl, medical fentanyl, because maybe she's got arthritis or something going on with her hands. <clears throat> yeah. Or some other health issue. Or Julian left it there for his sister to use it against Shemay with the cigarettes because Julian had access, access to different kinds of drugs because he was a drug dealer. But this wasn't street street fentanyl. This was something. This was medical fentanyl, which was in low doses, and it was accumulative, just enough to sedure. Okay. So anyway, that's you know. Every everybody has their own story when it comes to this kind of stuff because there's different kinds of fentanyl, and there's different methods to introduce it to the body. Okay, you can put it in somebody's drink. You can put it in somebody's food. You can leave it here on the on the on the counter on the on the, you know like on the desk with just a line of, you know depending on the analog and the and how strong it is. You can leave just a grain a grain or two like salt on here. And yeah, you can come and just touch it like that. And if it's a carfinol of some sorts, it goes into your skin and yeah, you'll you can die. It, 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 right? Or it could be a medical fentanyl that you know will just kind of make you Ah, get over here. Into La La Land. And put you to sleep. Ah. And you, you know, the doctor prescribed it, so somehow it's okay. But if you don't know what's wrong with you, because it was never prescribed to you, how would you know that somebody was plotting and scheming to knock you off? And that was just the precursor to do it.
So I didn't come into contact with medical fentanyl when I was breathing into Shimei's mouth. Also, you have to remember, Julian cleaned her up. That's why her lips were dry. That's why her shirt was changed. Okay? Because when he finally got to her, knowing that Tisha wasn't coming out, he changed her, cleaned her up, wiped her face down, cleaned up everything in the living room so nothing could be found. And then he went and got Tisha. And then by the time Tisha got to him, the, the bubbles were coming out of her nose, but her lips were still dry. By the time I came down, which was a minute and a half later, right, the bubbles were really coming out of her nose and the m bubbles in her mouth were really starting to come out. Okay? Because they were already happening before he cleaned her up. That's why he cleaned her up. So the fentanyl was already in her system. It was already absorbed through the smoking, through the smoke into the lungs. Get over here. Okay? So if you don't quite understand fentanyl, because, you know, you have to read, right? And who wants to read scientific papers and look at different types of analogs when it comes to fentanyl? But it's pretty straightforward. Just Google fentanyl analogs, and you'll see little articles that will come up and show you how the model molecule structures are pieced together for this type of fentanyl. The molecule structures are pieced together for that type of fentanyl, and so on and so on. And each each analog, right? Each type of they all play a different role, and. Um, pose danger with, I guess, different dosages. Yeah. If you've never taken fentanyl before, you wouldn't know what it feels like. You wouldn't know that you were being poisoned. And even then, even if you did take fentanyl before, and you started to feel nauseated, dizzy, sleepy, would you associate that it was you were being poisoned with medical fentanyl, or would you just assume that maybe you came down with a flu, or that you were coming down with the flu? I suppose you'd have to know what fentanyl, medical fentanyl feels like. If you had the experience of the feeling from the past, then yeah, maybe you might be able to associate with it. But if you've never felt it before, how would you know? You wouldn't know. And that's why they used medical fentanyl. But it was enough to criminalize her with the public union sector and the healthcare system. And then throw in the cocaine and the morphine just solidified them demonizing her so that they could do what they did. To distract away from what I they did. You. I see you. I see to justify what they did. And then try and guilt trip you and gaslight you by saying, well, we're just trying to help. We're just trying to save her life because she's young. Why are you questioning us when we're doing the best that we can for your daughter? You ungrateful bitch. Well, I'm questioning what I'm looking at here because the last time I seen that, it was from a dead body because I know what an embalmed body looks like. And Shemaine was embalmed when I walked into that room. <coughs> and the clues were there. I'm not talking one or two people. I'm talking all over the fucking place, okay? On both arms. I'm surprised they didn't cover up her arms with ice packs to cover up their freaking crime. So I hope that helps you, Lillian and Linda Waters. Because as it is, with the shit that's going on in the world, if you're not of criminal mind, you're not safe. Nope. Because our governments aren't keeping us safe. Nope. And neither are the police. <coughs> so I think we need to... I don't know. 
start a support group or something. Okay, now that's just cheating. <clears throat> it took an hour just to say all that. And did I even accomplish anything? I don't know. And I'm kind of getting a headache. And honestly, I can't get a headache because I can't take Tylenol and none of that crap. You already know what I'm bringing out, Biscuit. Shut up. You're talking too loud. So I don't want to work myself up into a tizzy. It's called a meeting gun. This is my first coffee of the day. It better be my last coffee for hours and hours and hours and hours and hours. And hours, and hours because, yeah, God forbid if I get a freaking headache before I go off and do this thing. But I want to get as much as is done. I, I, I'd like to finish it if I could, but we're only on page 11. Hmm. Okay, so maybe I'm going to take a little break here, and then I'm just going to come and read and go all longer, and then I'm going to upload. Okay, some of this stuff is pretty easy-peasy reading, if you can see here. Okay, Hi, this is where... this. Hi, Shut up! This is where... Uh, um, Julian and, and Tamika start texting Tisha to uh, pass over the baby. Mm -hmm. So that 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 doesn't that that's pretty easy reading. But then, you know, it's me talking. That's the issue, right? But this is what people need to do if they find themselves in a situation like mine. Before they accept what's being told to them by people that they don't know and clearly have um, agendas because the world itself is corrupt, right? And the word ethics has gone out the door. You know. Yeah, okay. So, April 11, 2018. Oh, here we go again. Judy learns of fentanyl before FHA staff mentioned it to her. And that... Shut up! And that's because... Next day, got up in the morning, went to court with my son, was at court all day. By the time I got back, it was after in the evening, like, you know, after four or five or whatever it was. And then I was informed via through the grapevine that Shimei had fentanyl, just fentanyl, right? Not medical, not nothing, just fentanyl in her system. She, she, it, it, I was told a high dose of fentanyl in her system. And that was because there's somebody that works at the hospital that went and read her medical files. And then relayed that information to Tisha, who relayed it to me. So when I went to the hospital on the 13th or whatever it was, the 12th or whatever it was, whenever I went back to the hospital, that's when they told me that she had fentanyl in her system. But I already knew that because I got that information from Tisha who got it from somebody that works at the hospital and went up and read Shemay's chart and told Tisha. Okay. But that person told Tisha it was a high dose of, of fentanyl. Where the coroner is saying it was medical fentanyl. To which, I don't know if it was a high dose, low dose, but medical fentanyl isn't as potent as street fentanyl or carfanol. And now they've got another analog that's even worse. <laughs> so, anyway, I'll be back. Hold on. Okay, yeah, and I, I forgot to mention this, and I've, I've never mentioned this because it slips my mind, but this is another clue, people, and it, 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 and it aligns himself up with what truth for reality pointed out from the very beginning when he did his first video on Shemay. Where, <clears throat> the, how the morphine and the cocaine got into her system was via through injection. Okay? And that was used to cover the fact that she was being poisoned with medical fentanyl and to finish the job. Alright? <clears throat> Make sure she was really dead. Alright? Because it's a speedball, right? And, uh, what do you call it? 
Do you remember when I said he cleaned up, Julian cleaned up everything? No candy wrappers, no ashtray, no cups, no water, no plates, nothing, no, nothing. There was, it was spotless, okay? So, anyway, after everything was all said and done, and, you know, the cops came and said, oh, no, she committed suicide. Oh, no, okay, well, it was an accident, whatever. A couple of months went by. <coughs> right? <coughs> and I was doing my food prep. Okay? And, uh, now, I know for a fact, after Sierra was basically finally removed from the basement, in terms of, she just wasn't allowed in anymore because... You just couldn't trust her. You turn your back on her, then you'd look at her. Next thing you know, she'd be ODing right there in f behind your back, and you'd have to call the cops and all this other crap, right? And nine one one and whatever and whatever. Okay, so the kids just finally said, "That's it, no more. No, you're not allowed inside the basement, not even for two minutes." And it kind of like got that way up here with me, even because, okay, that's not what I'm talking about. But the point is. When she was downstairs going in and out and whatever, and the kids were giving her a chance and whatever, and we even got the video of, of her in the bathroom with Julian there, and she made, you know, recording saying, you know, you need to leave because you're doing the drugs, and, you know, Julian running around, you know, and, you know, okay, so the point is, is she used to go into the bathroom and she'd do her drugs, and, um, I don't know. I cleaned out underneath the sink anything and everything because I was getting ready to do food prep, right? And I needed storage for my jars with food in them, right? And I know for a fact that I had cleared everything out and that Sierra wasn't even around. Okay, there, so I know that for a fact. I know it for a fact, right? And then a few months later, now I'm ready to put some jars down there or do something and so I go underneath the bathroom sink and you know I'm moving things around there was no, wasn't very much down and, and I and I did find a syringe people I one one syringe and I'm like and the one oh, and it was a little bag or something there just like an empty little you know little bag just empty right and, and I'm like well that wasn't there when I cleaned everything out and I'm like, well, you know, where did it come from, right? This is after she may died. And we're talking, you know, three or four months later, right? And I'm like, well, I don't think Mark Kane's friends do drugs, right? You know, did he have somebody, one of his buddies come over and, you know, they're shooting up in the bathroom? And, like, where the hell did this shit come from? Because it wasn't there when I cleaned up because, you know, we made sure that Sierra wasn't coming around. So there's absolutely, because Sierra used to leave her, her rigs around, right? And stuff, eh? And uh, that's why we just said that's enough and we're, we're fed up with it, right? And, and um, so she started leaving them out in the yard. So anyway, you know, I, I found it and like, Several months had gone by by this point, and the cops closed the case and everything, and, you know, and I, I just let it slide, people. I let it slide. Right? Where I probably should have saved it. But it wasn't like I could take that rig and take it to the cops and have them open up Shemay's case hey, again and and test it to see if there was cocaine and morphine in it and if Julian's stop. fingerprints were on it. Do, do you see where I'm going with that? Right? Because they didn't care. If they would have cared, I would have definitely passed it over to them and maybe they would have found his fucking fingerprints on it. The point is, it w is I cleaned out underneath the sink. There was no reason for it to be there. Sierra hadn't been coming around. Sierra had the little house. She didn't need to come around. She was still living at the little house when this was all going on. Okay? So where the hell did that rig come from? Because it wasn't Mark Kane and his friends, that's for sure, right? It was it was what Julian used. That's what Julian used, and he threw it underneath the bathroom sink because he knew that that's what, happened, what Sierra was doing when she was coming around for those years when social services threw her out in the streets. Okay. So that's another clue. And if the cat, cops would have done their job correctly as soon as I found that thing it should have been passed over to the cops as evidence 
and they should have done a forensic test to see what was inside and they should have ran fingerprints on it people and they didn't because they wouldn't have taken it anyway so I just threw it out and then basically forgot about it and if it wouldn't have been for truth for reality pointing out what he pointed out in his videos I wouldn't have been able to connect the dots because I do believe like that after after the smoking of the ment medical fent there's only two ways that bruise got on her head she either got it when that night when I heard the banging on the wall with the phone ringing and then all of a sudden everything got quiet because he knocked her on the head and knocked her out right or he came up behind her or stood in front of her either or on the day that she was witnessed to have the death rattle just to subdue her a bit more before he came back in and fucking shot her up to cover up murder knowing that the cops would blame the fentanyl and then criminalize her with the cocaine so that people wouldn't be interested in the story and would rather just say well she deserved what she got so don't come to us because you obviously were a lousy mother you couldn't control your kids you, you, you didn't love them you didn't do enough for them you know blah 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 get the way you know get out of here right yeah right but they're the ones that are walking around with my daughter's heart in their chest yeah and everything else that they took from her body and they imported it into their body so they can live another 5, 10, 15 more years assuming that they don't go off and do a what's his name um, McCain what's his name McCain you know that guy with that freaking tumor on his face that used to work for the American government he had something like 10 heart surgeries I think he's dead now where did all those hearts come from Why was he so lucky? So yeah, there is a needle involved. I just threw it out because the cops wouldn't have gave a damn shit rat's ass about it anyway. And I know for a fact it wasn't there. Because after we finally got Sierra out of the house and I needed food space for storage, I cleaned out everything. I cleaned that bathroom, all the drawers underneath, whatever, and you know, right? And it was just the one and it was chucked off into the back and I found it really strange like I'm like no no I cleaned underneath there there's no way for that thing to be here well we know where it came from and we can thank truth for reality on that one because if he would never have pointed out what he pointed out I wouldn't have been able to connect the dots no. it's just I never talked about that because you know it's like you know there's a part of you that starts to give up. You accept it. You know, suck it up, buttercup. Right? But looking back, it's just another needle in that haystack. That's all that was. Alright, so let's just read for a bit, and I guess we're going to have to end this video and start again, but i got to start laundry. i got to do the bathroom and just do whatever. Okay, let's try and read. And of course, the eye is going, eee. I almost want to cancel this rotor rooter around my iris. I'm going to say to the doctor when I see him, is there any way we can just not do it? because I had this bad dream. I'm going to tell him my, my dream. <laughs> right? Right? <laughs> you, you did your little rotor rooter and the only thing that it produced was a completely white eye with just this little black ring around it. And there was no iris, there was no pupil, it was all white. Everything else was white except this little black ring around it. So what does that tell me in my dream? Maybe I don't think we should do this eye surgery. What do you think, doctor? I know it'll say, oh no, no, don't worry, everything will be fine. And I'll be like, yeah, okay. And then it will be another deja vu, like when I gave birth to Tisha. <laughs> uh. so 
you won't see it because I'll still have an iris, I'll still have a pupil, but I'll see it looking from the inside out where everything will be white. And I might just get this little ring around and now that's all I'll see. And if it gets to that point, I'll have to wear freaking eye patches on because there's no way I could go through life glaring at white shit all the time. With my eyes open, that is. There's just no way. There's no way. <laughs> 104. Oh, boy. Before going to the hospital to see Shemay, let's just read for a while and then we'll just call it quits, okay? And then I'll try and start up later on today after I get some laundry done and stuff, right? Before going to the hospital to see Shimei for 9 p.m. after the nurse nurse's shift changed, right? You couldn't come in until 9. But of course they were running late because they had a complication somewhere along the way. Judy was informed by Tisha that one of Shimei's close friends. Okay, so this happened on the day this happened on the day, this sounds like this happened on the day, this was before 9 o'clock, so I knew, I knew, even before I walked into the room to see Shmei, <coughs> that fentanyl <coughs> was suspected. <coughs> okay, this is why you have to write this stuff down. Okay, because I didn't go on the 13th, my son went on the 13th. Because he did that video with the recording because they were continuing to let Julian in. Even though I told him on the 11th that I didn't want those people in there. I didn't want anybody in there unless they got permission by me. Or my kids. Right? And they went behind our back. And they were letting Julian and everybody else under the sun walk in and out of that room like it was a fucking display case. As to what, as to, and it was. Right? It was. Even though she had a super bug. Okay, you got you got somebody supposedly laying up on a hospital bed with a superbug, but you're allowing every Tom, Dick, and Harry off the street just to wander on in and have a looky-loo. Yeah, okay, okay, yeah, 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 right. So they can take that superbug and spread it out on the streets, right? Mm-hmm, yeah, okay. <laughs> anyway, I'm having a hard time with these glasses, man. Holy Lord. Lordy, lordy, lordy. And then, of course, we've got this, right? Maybe these glasses would work, but if you notice, look what's going on there. Oh, shit. Oh, yeah. Okay. This might be a little better. Okay. Uh, by T.O.K. Okay, so let's just read this again. Before going to the hospital to see Shimei for 9 p.m. So this was on the day that she died. Right? After the nurse's shift change, Judy was informed by Tisha that one of Shimei's close friends had seen her medical chart and that it read where Shimei had overdosed on a high dose of fentanyl. That's what they wrote somewhere in her medical file on the day that they brought her in. And because that person worked in the hospital, found out that Shimei was in the hospital, wandered up to the ICU and read her chart and then relayed that information to Tisha, who relayed it to me. So I knew before I even walked in that fentanyl was involved. But I didn't say anything because I was asked not to say anything. Because the person that told Tisha wasn't technically supposed to read Shimei's chart. Okay? Judy went to the hospital for 9 p.m. with her son, Mark Hain, And when they arrived to the ICU, Julian, his mother, and his sister were all waiting in the reception area to go see Shimei. 106. Judy requested hospital staff to not allow Julian or his 
related family members or friends to see Shimei at this time because Judy feared even more for her daughter's state as she believed Julian had something to do with Shimei's demise. I don't need to explain that. You already know. 107. Julian has a history of drug dealing, arguing with Shimei, and not wanting to work a legitimate job. In addition to, he had already lived in a house about one year ago where a person possibly died from an overdose of fentanyl and cocaine. That's when he came back to my house with that safe. And busted it up and left it freaking broken in my in my garage as he was running around raging doing other stupid shit. 108. Hospital staff and that's he then he tried to move back in and I said, Get the fuck out. It took me a month to get him out and then and that's when he finally moved to his mother's house. Hospital staff allowed Julian, his mother and sister, to see Shimei anyway before Judy and her son finally got to go into her room after those people left. So hospital staff put them first before the mother. Okay? Alright? 109. The attending nurse did not say much other than to purport as to how well Fraser Health Authority staff were looking after Shimei with their machines. That's true. 110. Although the nurse did mention how Shimei's organs had been severely damaged and listed them in order with liver, kidney, lungs, heart, and brain to be most severely affected. And when Judy asked about all the brute... And when... Judy asked about all the bruising on Shimei's arms and on her neck with blood leaking out. The nurse said that her blood was turning into water. That was disturbing people to see that. Okay. The nurse, number 111, the nurse gave the impression that Shimei had somehow done this to herself because Shimei had cocaine in her system. Now you have to remember, they're not telling me about the fentanyl. Okay? They criminalized her with the cocaine. Okay? And Judy re reminded the nurse that people don't normally die doing cocaine if it were even true that Shimei did. I can't see very well. Cocaine on her own accord before going to sleep after she took care of the baby before her sister got home. Because they were saying she did drugs on her own accord at 8 o'clock in the morning. She did it to herself. What do you expect? Right? You know, she got what she deserved. Like, seriously, this is how they talk to you people. Right? 112. The nurse was more interested in trying to convince Judy that Shimei was an addict of some sort. That she was... Than she was to accept what Judy was saying about her daughter and that Julian probably had something to do with Shimei's demise. So the woman was arguing with me, right? Arguing with me, right? Saying, oh, no, no, Shimei did it to herself. You need to accept that. You know, she must have been a closet addict. You weren't paying attention. Obviously, you didn't notice. But clearly, there's something wrong here because, you know, she's sitting up in here with cocaine in her system. That tells you that she's some kind of addict, Miss Chorney, right? Okay, so you're arguing, you know, in a, in a, in, in a diplomatic kind of way, right? 113, oh my lord, <laughs> 113, 
Judy and her son did not stay long and was not at the hospital for any longer than one hour. April 12, 2018. Judy applies <coughs> for interim guardianship and is informed about fentanyl. So they told me, I don't know, we'll find out. I don't remember how they told me. I just know that I knew before I walked in and seen Shemae <coughs> on the first day. 114. I guess you can say that's a clue. 114. Judy and Marcane Chorney went to the provincial court in Surrey, B.C. early in the morning, but before getting there, they dropped off more formula to Tisha for the baby. <laughs> 115. Tisha told her mother that the police had called at about 8.30 a.m. to tell her that they were not going to investigate into what happened to Shimei because it was determined that Shimei's injury was suffered from a natural cause. What's the natural cause? See, this is why it's important that you write this stuff down, people. Don't be gullible. Okay, because we're coming into another clue here. Tisha relayed this message to her mother. I don't have a cell phone. And they didn't call my home phone number. And I was out the door early with my son. Because I was in panic mode. Okay? 116. Marcane and his mother were both at the courthouse all day from 9.30 a.m. until 4 p.m. <clears throat> when Judy got to see a judge who granted a four-day interim guardianship for Amari under an emergency ex parte hearing. But I'm still stuck on 115 in terms of the cops called Tisha at 8.30 in the morning to tell her that they're not investigating because she may died of natural causes. Okay, go up on that one. Anyway, 117. By 4.30 p.m., both Marcane and Judy were at the hospital talking to FHA, Fraser Health Authority staff, with the acting social worker named Allie at that time. It was then both parties were informed that Shimei had overdosed in fentanyl, on fentanyl. So is that the natural cause of death, an overdose of fentanyl? Is that what the police were referring to? Hmm? Because when you think of natural cause, you think of a heart attack, a brain aneurysm, something like that. You don't think of a, you don't think of a, you don't think of a, an overdose. An overdose is not a natural cause, people. Although nobody from Fraser Health Authority could give specifics around any questions that Judy asked regarding how fentanyl react, reacts to the body or how it was introduced into her body or in what amount was in the body. Because as soon as they said that, of course, that was my cue. Question, 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 question. Couldn't answer, couldn't answer, couldn't answer, couldn't answer but yet we're willing to criminalize, ostracize, and delete. One hundred and eighteen. On the contrary, it was suggested again that Shemay must have done what happened to... Yeah, they kept pushing that. She did it to herself. She knew better. She, she should have known better. This, this is her fault. You know, she right? Right? She did it to herself. She knew what she was doing. She took the risk. Oh, well, suck it up, buttercup. Okay. On the contrary, it was suggested again that Shimei must have done what happened to her by herself as hospital staff didn't want to acknowledge that Shimei was purposely poisoned with fentanyl. So clearly I'm saying, hold on, no, 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 she didn't do it by herself. Did, you know, somebody introduced it to her body, and how did it get in there, and how much would it take to cause this result, and blah, 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 and yeah, okay. So they didn't want to answer those questions, and then switched it on to Shemaine. 
arguing again on the second day. Argue on the first day, argue on the second day. Okay? 119. A request was made against... Oh, sorry. A request was made again by Judy to not allow Julian or his associates to come into Shemay's room as she advised hospital staff and the social worker that Shemay was purposely injured more than likely by Julian with the intent of him to cause her serious harm and or her death. So I was specific as to why I didn't want them there. Okay? <clears throat> What's his problem? Give him a toy. He has toys. We'll sit him up maybe. He is sitting up. Amari, stop your whimpering. 120. Judy asked the nurse and the social worker to put forward a request to do a hair follicle test. Now I have Shemay's hair, but the nurse only gave me a few strands. But there is came something like like um the follicle like the you know the root and there's something in the bag which I believe to be embalming makeup. Still there. I just don't know where to send it to have it tested properly with integrity. I wouldn't be surprised they can determine that there's embalming makeup in that bag. Uh-huh. But I'm requesting for a hair follicle because they kept insisting that she was an addict and that she had been doing drugs like an addict without us knowing about it because she was a closet addict and therefore she deserved what she got. So don't be surprised that she's there lying there looking like she it is, right? Like they, they humiliate you. Okay. A request was made again by Judy to not allow... Okay, read that. Judy asked the nurse and social worker to put forward a request to do a hair follicle test to determine when Shemay was poisoned because of the subliminal accusations towards Shemay being an addict or at least a recreational drug user by her choice. And even if she was, people, doesn't warrant murder by fentanyl doesn't warrant people dying by fentanyl with the cops sloughing it off as it's business as usual. They should have known that, that, right? Okay, this is a dangerous substance which falls under the Substance Act, which should be banned from the streets, and people that are pushing this out into the community should be dealt with in a criminal court of law and sent to jail. That's why we have the Dangerous Substance Act. It's an actual legislation that is made to protect the people from this kind of shit. But if you notice, the government doesn't use their acts unless it benefits them. So if they want to charge somebody for running around because they managed to catch him with a whole bunch of fentanyl and make a nice little news report, then they would call in this, this Dangerous Substance Act and they would use that act in their $2 million court proceeding because they busted some guy with, you know, 50 pounds of fentanyl. But for everybody else that's running around on the street, fuck no, they don't give a shit. They don't give a shit. They want it to happen. That's when they ignore their Dangerous Substance Act. Like they ignored it with Julian. <clears throat> oh boy. Recreational drug use user by her choice. FHA staff refused to follow up on that request by saying the hospital didn't do hair follicle tests and that Judy would have to arrange that for herself, which is a bunch of crock, people. I'm pretty sure that's a bunch of fucking crock. Because if 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 social services wanted to remove a child for some from some mother or something like that or something or something or they were doing a real forensic autopsy or something or something, oh yeah, they they'd be pulling in that card if it benefited them. But if it prove not to benefit them, then of course they're not going to do it. Right? Through a private lab. Well, we're still waiting for the private lab. It's up there.
I'll show you. All these years. Here's another clue. Another needle in the haystack. I don't know how much they need to be able to test for things. I just know that when everybody asked for Shimei's hair and went to start grabbing her hair after they turned off that machine, the nurse got all panicky and said, "Oh no, go away, go away! You can't. We need. We can't touch the body because it's going for autopsy, and the and the person that does the autopsy can't have the body touched for not for nothing." You can't have no hair because she's being autopsied. The, the pathologist needs to have a full fucking head of hair. Because everybody wanted a keepsake, right? And she refused. And I said, well, okay, well, I need at least something, a little bit, because, you know, I want my hair follicle test, right? <laughs> so she, she, she gave way, and she went, and she just plucked a little teeny bit. Of course she didn't pull hard. Of course she didn't want people to start pulling on her hair. Because as soon as they'd done that, her face would have fucking came off. No. So you have to remember, her face was falling off, people. Yeah. Let's see. Let's see if you can see anything here. I can't really see. Mm. So you can see, let's see, let's see if you can see. There's some of her hair in there. I can't see, maybe you can see, I don't know. And then, you have to remember she had embalming makeup on. Because they were touching her up all the time, right? And then there's a little, a little cruddy thing in here in one of these bags. It's cruddy. Which makes me think it's embalming makeup. I don't know. I used to be able to see, but I can't see now. I've never opened it. I've never opened it. And I don't even know if it's enough to even get a test. And I don't know where the crud is because I can't see. I just know it's in there. Because I used to see, I guess her hair is somewhere around in here. I want to find that little cruddy thing. Anyway, okay? I wanted to get a hold of Mike Adams from Natural News and see if he could test it. I tried to email him, but he doesn't answer his emails. So, that didn't happen. Because I'm a, I'm, I'm, I wouldn't know who to, where to get that tested. I don't even know if there's enough there to even, if it's even possible. But I would think so under the microscope, ex especially with the embalming makeup. Yeah, maybe, you never know, but whatever. But that's all we got, because everybody wanted a little piece of her hair for a keepsake. And they were going to go and try and get for themselves. And she oh no, nobody can touch anything, because the pathologist needs a full fucking head of hair to do the autopsy. Okay. And again, people are dumb. They believed it. So they didn't touch it. And I said, well, I need at least a little something. So just to appease me, she gave me just a little bit. But she might have given me some embalming makeup not realizing it was stuck on her finger and somehow it got into the bag and it's and it's still there after all these years yeah. <laughs> Shimei was not responding to any protocols that related to FHA and their machines that kept her heart beating well, the only reason I wrote that down is because that's what I was told. But her heart wasn't beating. 
that wasn't confirmed. I never put my hand on her chest. I never seen her chest move up and down. I never seen anything move in her mouth to suggest that she was breathing. I was just told that she was breathing and I took it for face value because, you know, you don't want to get too close to the body because it's got a super bug on it and you're already you're already freaked out, right? And you know, they're they're attacking you every time you come in and you're asking questions or you're, you know, requesting something and you know, they're making you feel like shit and they're con trying to convince you that you there's something wrong with your daughter in terms of she She's an addict, and she deserved what she got, so, you know, right? Take a swipe here, take a swipe there, take a swipe here. Oh, I, re I forgot to read this one. Okay, I forgot to read 121. So I was supposed to take that to a private, private lab and have it tested. 121. Shimei was not responding to any protocol, protocol that related to FHA and their machines that kept her heart beating. And hospital staff also had her whole body covered with ice packs with the nurse saying it was good for brain swelling and organ damage. So I guess they had the ice pack also in her torso area but they didn't have it in her arms people it was her legs and maybe on the torso that's why I put hole right but I already said the leaking right 122 Shimei's body was bloated and deteriorating but hospital, oh, she looked awful. She looked embalmed. <laughs> she felt embalmed. Shimei's body was bloated and deteriorated. From 6 o'clock to 9 o'clock, she went from a normal body to a, a fucking overblown balloon that was ready to explode at any moment that felt like plastic that was leaking all over the place on her arms and on the neck. All in the space of three hours. What do you think happened? Shimei's body was bloated and deteriorating, but hospital staff, for some reason, led Shimei's family members and anyone else who came to see her think that Shimei was alive when in fact she was not except for a machine pumping her heart. So I am letting the cops in. I'm, I'm informing the cops. This went to the cops, to the investigators, that she's dead. And if there was any truth to her being alive, to any capacity, it was only because of a machine doing that. But we know, you know, oh my lord, <laughs> things dropping. I don't want this camera to drop. Okay. All right. Oh my lord. 123. Judy requested copies of Shimei's medical files and was told that she'd have to go to records department during business hours. 124. Judy and her son did not stay long and was not at the hospital for any longer than 1 hour. Okay. So we went to the hospital, I guess, after court. Right? We went to the hospital at 9, and then we went again after court on the way home from court, and then we came home. So April 11, 2018, Julian texts Tisha. This is the day Shimei went into the hospital. This is the day Shimei died. Julian texts Tisha with at 3.43 p.m. Jules. No. So he just puts Jules at 3.43 p.m. She may went into the hospital at 10.30. Was dead by 9. 
and he's texting her at 3.43 with the name Jules. Tisha responds with 6.31 p.m. Hey, are you with Shemay? Julian texts Tisha with 6.31 p.m. I'm with... I'm at Timmy's. WBU. I guess what about you? How is Amari? Tisha responds with 631. What? What's the matter, Andre? Okay, Amari, uh, Kyrie, just stay quiet. Nana just trying to run through this fast. 631 p.m. I'm at home just getting more food for him, and he's good. He is with Alex's dad at the moment. I just forgot a few things, so I came back to pick it up. Julian texts Tisha with 6.31 p.m. Tisha, what are we going to do? When your mama coming? Tisha responds with 6.31 p.m. I don't know. We will think of something and she will be there at 9 at 9. Okay, so this is on that day, right? Julian texts Tisha with 6.31 p.m. Okay, because you have to remember, they kicked everybody out. They kicked Tisha and Julian and Tamika at 6 o'clock out. So he's sitting up at Timmy's. Tisha came back home. Now that I'm, and now that she's home, I'm downstairs running around because she came, right? Okay, anyway. So Julian texts Tisha with 6.31 p.m. Okay, is she spending the night? Asking me if I'm going to spend the night with uh, Shemay. Tisha responds with 6.31 p.m. I will ask her. I just left. I will call her. Julian texts Tisha with 6.31 p.m. Okay. Tisha responds with 6.31 p.m. I think she went to the store the phone is just ringing. I will let know when I find out. I was looking for paperwork for court the next day and any clues that I could find. Julian texts Tisha with 6.31 p.m. Okay, because then I'll ask for another bed. <laughs> yeah, okay, as if I'm going to lay next to you, motherfucker, in Shemay's ICU room. I guess he was planning on spending the night there on a cot. <coughs> Tisha responds with 6.31 p.m. No, she is not. She is coming with my brother. We will go again tomorrow. Stop it! Julian texts Tisha with 6.31 p.m. Okay, I'm going to still spend the night. What time are they coming by? And also, what time did you get home this morning? Because, you know, he's got to fix his story up, right? I'm just trying to figure out what time she left me in bed. She didn't leave you in bed. You came here and she left her room and she went into Tisha's room. Like, how long was she on the couch by herself? Question mark, question mark. I don't know. You came out at 9 o'clock, Julian. 5 to 9. And you stood right over her with the death rattle. And you got startled and then got pissed off because Tisha was there sitting in the dark in the kitchen looking at you. Then you got scared and you ran off down the fucking hall. 
Then you hid out for a few minutes. Then you went back and you moved Shmay's dead body after she urinated and defecated and you laid her down. Then you hid out behind the fucking wall unit waiting for Tisha to finish the laundry and go back into her room. And then when you felt that it was safe to go back into Shimei's room, that's when you snuck off back down the hall and you went back into Shimei's room thinking that Tisha would just wander out and find Shimei the way you left her. But it turned out that's not what happened. And after about an hour, you knew that it was just a matter of time before the lividity was over with and it was, the body was going to start going into rigor mortis. So therefore, you had to now start getting attention to the problem that you fucking created before, before you actually, you know, had a stiff body going into rigor mortis. Because if it would have went into rigor mortis, it would have been a whole different ball game. They wouldn't be taking a body with rigor mortis to the Surrey Memorial Hospital. They'd be taking a body of rigor mortis to the Abbotsford freaking hospital for an autopsy. Because the coroner would have been called. It was timed. Tisha responds with 6.31 p.m. They will be there nine. Same with Anissa. And I seen her at seven AM. She left my room at eight. Okay, we know that. My sorry for the late reply. Julian texts Tisha with nine twenty six PM. I got the boot from your mother. What the fuck? She thinks I did this to her, Tisha. Tisha responds with 9.26 p.m. Why did you guys start fighting? Julian texts Tisha with 9.26 p.m. We didn't really fight. Your mom came in and don't want me to be around. She asked if I was staying the night. I said yes. Then she told the nurse that I'm not allowed. I never spoke to Julian. I never spoke to Julian. I didn't say one bad word to him. They went in. They left. I told them. I told the nurse when they were inside. This is you tell them. Don't fucking come back. Yeah. That's it. Don't let them back in. Mm -mm -mm. You need to get the police involved. I want an investigation. Where's the doctor? The doctor needs to call an investigation. But of course there is no doctors around to do that, right? <coughs> April 12th, 2018, Julian texts Tisha. Julian texts Tisha. So this is the next day at 7.16 a.m. in the morning. Can I take my son for the day? That's the first thing he says. Okay, I told you. All right? 9.02 a.m. Please call me ASAP. So he left the hospital with his mom and his sister and then they went back and started plotting and scheming how they could get Amari. <coughs> 10.28am. When are you going back to the hospital? Question mark, question mark, because Tisha's not answering yet, right? Tisha responds with 10.28am. I don't know yet, later on. Julian texts Tisha with 10.28am. Okay. Just let me know. Julian texts Tisha with at 12.39 p.m. Hey, can me and my mom come by and grab Amari for the day? Is the going to the is the going to be a problem with me seeing my son? If so, can you call in so I can see Shamay? Why are you guys pushing me out? I have a right to see my son at least. Question mark. Please answer me. Can you make it so I can see Shimei then? Question mark. Question mark. Julian texts Tisha with at 5.34 p.m. Okay. Has anything changed? Question mark. Can I see my son? Question mark, question mark. Tisha responds with 5.34 p.m. She isn't home still, and it would probably be better when he is 
talked when he is not sick. Yeah, you have to remember he had his first real bad cold, right? <coughs> not sick. He has a really bad cough <coughs> and all that. <coughs> but I'm going to talk to my mom as soon as she gets home <coughs> and see what she says about you going to the hospital. I will contact you when I talk to her and tell you what she said. She wouldn't she would probably be home in the next hour or sooner. Julian text Tisha with 5:34 p.m. Okay. I'll still want to see Amari whether sick or not. I'll come by the house then. So now he's now he's in, superimposing himself back into my house which was not unusual. <coughs> he wasn't invited to come here. Clearly we didn't want him here because if we didn't want him in the hospital room with Shmei, what made him think he could come here? Anyway, Julian texts Tisha with 5.34 p.m. I'm at my mom's house. I'm on my way there from White Rock. This is Julian. Okay, I'm at my mom's house. I'm on my way there from White Rock. WBU. I'm almost home. Tisha responds with at 534. So this is going back and forth, back and forth. You can come by my you can come by my mom and then and yeah. them are back but I'm leaving now. soon, so now. you should come ASAP. <clears throat> it's because, you know, Tisha's trying to be neutral. She's trying to be fair. <clears throat> Just like Shimei was trying to be fair with Julian when he came scratching at 6.30 in the morning, let me in, let me in. <clears throat> My mother's house got robbed. I can't go home. I need to sleep for a while and hide out here until things calm down. <clears throat> So she invites him now to the house. Because, you know, what you going to say? Don't come when he's saying I'm coming. Anyway. <coughs> <coughs> My mom want you to come get your clothes. Okay, fair enough. She knew his clothes were in the laundry room. His little duffel bag. Julian text Tisha. 5.34 p.m. Okay, I'm going to take Amari too. Okay? I want him. I'm around the corner. You know how many times he would say, I'm around the corner? I'm coming to the house to smash out all your windows. I'm just around the corner. I'm coming to your house to blow it up, set on fire. I'm around the corner. Have your family come outside because I got a gun. I'm just around the corner. I'm shooting everybody. That's it. You're done. You're toast. Right? Do you know how many times he said that? with Shemay sitting here on her cell phone, whether talking or texting. I'm around the corner. I'd go downstairs, I'd say, Marcane, Amari's, uh, uh, um, Julian's around the corner. Can you please go outside and patrol the yard because we don't know what he's going to fucking do. Like, we were so scared, people. And we couldn't call the cops. Thanks to the cops and their bullshit with just the public union sector in general with what they did to Sierra. We have to rely on ourselves to protect ourselves from Julian. So my son would go out and patrol the fucking yard waiting for Julian because Julian was around the corner. Tisha responds with 5.34 p.m. All right, but 
you are not taking Amari. Julian texts Tisha with 6.34 p.m. I'm his father. I have rights to him. I'm here. Is the basement door open? So now he thinks he can just walk in. Do you see how he superimposed himself? <coughs> Tisha responds with... And if you notice the time, here's another clue. 534, 534, right? 534. This is all happening at 534. First he's in White Rock. When was he in White Rock? He wasn't in fucking White Rock. Right, White Rock. <coughs> he wasn't at his mother's house. <coughs> he was around the fucking corner here. Okay, do you see? Write this stuff down. Five years later, you're going to find another clue here. Okay? I don't know if this clue makes much of a difference. <coughs> <coughs> okay. I still want to see Amari, whether sick or not. I'll come by the house then. Tisha, 534. Where about are you? Julian, 534. I'm at my mom's house. <coughs> 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 by car <coughs> where his mother lived <coughs> it was a 15 minute drive from my house <coughs> this is at 534 <coughs> he's supposedly at his mother's house <coughs> but he also says that I'm on my way there from White Rock <coughs> White Rock is a 45 minute drive okay <coughs> <coughs> this guy stalked my yard. Oh, hold on a minute. What happens is, I'll well, put this eye drop in, right? It goes into the back of my nostril and starts going into my throat. <coughs> and I'm going like this. <coughs> and I can smell the fabric softener on this. <coughs> I'm allergic to those kind of things. <coughs> but yeah, no, this is all in the space of 534 people. So one minute, well, not even one minute, one second, he's saying, I'm at my mom's, which is 15 minutes away. <coughs> I'm coming in from White Rock, which is about a half an hour, 45 minute drive away. We're talking driving. <coughs> and then the next second, he says he's here at 534. So that means he was stalking my house. <coughs> and that wouldn't be unusual with him. And that's why his sister does that shit. Okay? Because that's what they do. <coughs> oh, no. There's something wrong with him. Okay? So, 534. I'm going to take Amari, too. Okay? I want him. I'm around the corner. <coughs> Tisha, 5.34 p.m. All right. <coughs> but <coughs> you are not taking Omari. Julian texts Tisha with 5.34 p.m. I'm his father, and I have right to, right, rights to him. I'm here. Is the basement door open? Tisha responds with 5.34 <clears throat> Maybe right now isn't the best time to go to the hospital. Julian texts Tisha with 534. Okay, just text me tomorrow. Hold on a minute. Okay, so you have to remember now, I haven't spoken to this guy. None of them. Since he walked out of the door with Tisha to jump into a taxi and go to the hospital. Never spoke to him at the hospital, never spoke to his mother, never spoke, spoke to his sister, none of that. Okay? So, you, you know, his only contact was Tisha, right? <clears throat> and, uh, obviously the 11th was pretty much a full day, right? Because 
they, Tisha and Julian and whoever was in the room there until six, and then the hospital staff kicked them out at six, and then they went back at nine. Not Tisha because she was at home with the kids. I went with my son and Marcane, but. Julian, his mother, and his sister were there. Were at night, and now we know that Julian was planning on sleeping on a cot for the night. <laughs> but first thing in the morning, he starts texting Tisha. Right? Oh my lord! <laughs> isn't 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 life just grand? Okay. You ready? April twelfth, two thousand eighteen. Julian comes to the house. To get Amari. 126. We're still on page 16. Oh, we're moving along. Julian came to the house at about 6 p.m. with his hair freshly cut, asking for, asking to take the baby. And Tisha told him that he wasn't allowed. Julian argued with Tisha outside. And then Tisha came upstairs to plead with her mother to allow Julian to at least see Amari briefly for a few minutes in the garage. Okay, we know what this story is going to turn out to be here in a second for anyone that's listened to my videos. 127. Andre, shut up! Julian also asked Tisha if he could get some of his things from the basement. And he went inside when Tisha went upstairs to talk to her mom. Honestly, I don't think she responded to him. He just took it upon himself, superimposed as he liked to do, and went inside. And his duffel bag, which he would have seen, was right there in the laundry room. So there was no reason to go into Shimei's room. But if you notice, he didn't go inside until Shimei. Uh, he, if you notice, he didn't go inside to the basement until Tisha came upstairs to get the baby because he pleaded that uh, you know, at least let me see the baby. Right? He needed an excuse to get into the into into the house, and he didn't want to be disturbed while he was in there because he was putting back Shimei's phone. Uh, 128. Marcane served Julian in the garage with court papers. So Marcane served him. So as Julian's talking to Tisha, Marcane came out, served him with the papers, whatever, went back inside. And then Tisha, you know, Julian wanted, insisted on seeing the baby even for five minutes or two minutes or whatever and needed the Tisha to leave the garage so that he could sneak into the house and sneak into Shimei's room, do what he wanted to do, grab the TV, and then fuck off. And by the time Tisha came down the stairs to give the, to show, like, to allow Julian to see the baby, he was gone with his mother. And it happened that fast. Julian was in the basement when Tisha was upstairs talking to her mom and when Tisha went downstairs with Amari so Julian could see him quickly in the garage, Julian had already left. 130. After Julian left, Tisha looked around in the basement and noticed that Julian had gone into Shimei's room and took a TV that had been there for over a year and over a year and a half and a PlayStation. Oh, he also took the PlayStation. Okay. I forgot about the PlayStation. Not that I care about those things. I can't stand those things. Andre with his Nintendo? Oh my god, you don't even know. <coughs> April 13th, 2018. So he got what he wanted. To put back the phone and take the TV and the PlayStation. And Amari was just the excuse. And his, and his mother helped him to do all that. <laughs> Fraser Health Authority staff allowed Julian to see Shmay. So, you know, I requested them not to be back allowed in there, right? But they went against my wishes. <clears throat> they didn't want to investigate nothing. They were too busy criminalizing Shmay, saying that she did it to herself. She deserved what she got. Right? There was something wrong with her because she was doing cocaine without anybody knowing about it. 
Just the whole nine yards. 131. When Tisha and Paige Morris went to see Shemay, Julian was seen to be outside on the hospital premises as well as a couple of other people who knew Shemay and to whom Shemay was not friends with Shanti anymore. So Julian started bringing people with him because the hospital themselves people put Shemay on display. Stupid cats fighting out on the porch. 132. Nick Shemay's friend came up to talk to Tisha and Paige and asked the girls why was Julian talking to those pooks over there? Pooks are like drug addicts and shit, right? 133. Tisha said she didn't know and then she asked Nick if they all had already been upstairs to see Shemay. He responded back that they had they all had. So not only were they not only were the staff allowing Julian to go in and out of there, but whoever else that we didn't even know who they were, people. One thirty four. Julian and Shanti approached Tisha, Paige and Nick and asked Tisha what day court was as if Tisha would know that's for Julian to know and because he got the papers and Tisha responded back that she would text him with that information 135 Julian said he was going back upstairs to say goodbye to Shemay and then everyone began to go to Shemay's room in the ICU so they they were comf they they you know they did what they wanted to do those people right they they were in control they made the decisions they had all the rights just like John Hart had the right to identify Sierra's dead body behind that closed door as you had that 6 foot 7 fucking face baby cop standing the door standing guarding the door keeping Sierra's family outside on the porch in the rain they allowed a person that was under suspicion of murder to identify Sierra's dead body through their fucking legislation as they held hostage the mother, the brother, and the father out in the rain on the porch as they were humiliating the family. Right? To, to, for the mind fuckery of it all. It was no different. No different. You're dealing with ghouls. So I say, Julian and the cops were working together, people. I stood between Julian and the cop. The cop cued Julian. He literally turned his head and went like that. And they looked eye to eye. I could see it. I felt it. As soon as the cop went like that, Julian went up. Oh, okay. The cop said, Judy, take him down to Shemay's room. Then they loaded Shemay up in that hammock with that perfusion machine. Julian was the decoy. Julian knew what he was doing. Julian had been in a situation like that before. When and where, I don't know, but he was. Because it was too fucking rigged. It was too smooth. It was too coordinated. <coughs> he was too comfortable. They let him walk. They let him brag in front of his fucking friends as they humiliated the family and stressed out the family. And I'm going for eye surgery? I'm almost tempted to tell this eye doctor, forget this rooter rooting around my iris, just put in the cataract, I'll pay for the cataract. It, it cancel this fucking rooter rooting shit because I'm so scared I'm going to lose all my eyesight because of it because of that dream that I had <coughs> <coughs> and of course if that happens the doctor will never take no responsibility because I consented to taking the risks yeah. 
but if I don't do the surgery, then, then I become the criminal. I'm the one that's being negligent by not following the doctor's advice and putting my life online with my eyes because if I don't do it, then the pressure remains high. It stays high, which means I could wake up at any fucking time and still be blind. Either way, I'm looking at being blind. I just feel like this shit might just make it worse because of what I'm dealing with in a broad sense when it comes to the public union sector people and how they use the healthcare system to target individuals to, to, to cover up crimes and to capitalize off of the bodies that they harvest from it. Why would I trust the healthcare system after reading this shit? I don't. I don't trust it for me. I sure in a heck don't trust it for Amari. That's why I'm so hoping that this lawyer finds a whole stack of needles and gets busy being the little seamstress that she can be and stitch it all together. Because if she's successful at fighting for Amari, then at least we have the, the resource of perhaps private care in combination with some public care. And then you have a, a little more control. If I want to go see a herbalist, because I can afford to pay a, a herbalist that's very good with their profession, in combination with a uh, doctor that's open-minded to use alternative medicine in combination with, I guess, traditional medicine when it comes to pharmacare, right? For, for just an overall good outcome, then, you know, yeah, that's what I want for Amari. Right? I want a functioning kitchen. Two times the size of what I got. That can be utilized to provide Amari with the things that he needs. And I want a functioning fucking laundry room. So you can do back to back to back to back, stack, stack, stack on table, table, table. And it's proficient and it's not hard on whoever's looking after him. And it's, and it's, and it's, and, and it's all being done in a timely manner. Just simple things like that. And then maybe if that can happen and you can establish a trust between the workers and the caregivers or whoever that's working with Amari to some degree or another then it would just be better but as it is right now no, no, no. more like on a fucking slave ship in a cage waiting to be let out so that people can poke and prod and do this and get on their little witch hunts and you know and take a snipe here and take a snipe there and if they hurt him oh well it's medical you know he, he needs to have his legs spread open like this and done that and done that and then just so that we can come back and say that his hips are coming out well how the fuck do I know that you didn't make them come out when you do this shit right it's not like I can go get a second opinion why can't why can't Amari have two doctors like one, like like one doctor that like the pediatrician, and then another doctor that's like dietitian that actually gives you recipes and takes the time to you know and just whatever and and knows about you know like chiropractors a little bit of this and muscle and you know and just and come in and do th massage therapy and you know don't talk to me about physiotherapy not once have you ever fucking massaged him in any capacity so what kind of physiotherapy are you giving me you give me a fucking splint and then you tell me to give him this that's not physiotherapy people a split and this to cover the pain is not physiotherapy. This to cover the fact that he doesn't want to be touched by them. What, docile him up so he doesn't move so you can again? Yeah, okay. Cut him open once 
Oh, it, it, it uh, oh, oh it, the pin slipped. We need to go in and operate again. Oh, well, sorry, Miss Chorney. He died on the operating table. Can I get an autopsy? No, you can't. It says under this legislation it's illegal. There are no independent autopsies in the province of British Columbia, Canada. So, therefore, you will never know what happened to your grandson. Uh -huh. Yeah, we know how it works. And I'm supposed to just be happy? Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. Let's just finish this page and I will start fresh after the fact. I'll upload this one and then because I can probably... Yeah, let's just finish this page because I'm, I'm getting mad. And I haven't even started laundry yet. Because I, I want, I, I want, I just want this done. I said I was going to do it a long time ago. I didn't do it because I knew it was going to be like this. <coughs> but after five years, it needs to be done. And we got another clue today. He wasn't in White Rock. He wasn't at his mother's house. He was just around the fucking corner the whole time he was texting Tisha saying that he was coming to get the baby. So, he was probably sitting in the bush, stalking my house. Watch it. And it wouldn't have been the first and the last time. And that's why Shimei's dead. One thirty-three. Tisha said she didn't know, and then she asked Nick if they all had already been upstairs to see Shimei. He responded back that they all had. 134. Julian and Shanti approached Tisha, Paige, and Nick and asked Tisha what day court was. Okay, we read that. 135. Julian said he was going back upstairs to say goodbye to Shimei and then everyone began to go to Shimei's room in the ICU room ICU so they all just started to walk past Tisha and superimpose themselves to go look through, do their little looky loos at that ugly woman laying up on a bed looking dead yeah we know how that works like I said, they had her on display. 136. Tisha waited outside of Shimei's room to let Julian and his friends say goodbye to Shimei, even though Shimei was dead. Okay? Paige went into the room with the group. And you have to remember, these, these hospital staff, they got everybody putting on gloves, smocks, and spooking them with a super bug, right? Because they don't want them to get too close to a dead body and figure out that the body is actually fucking dead, and that's what they're looking at. So they had to make people feel afraid to touch the body. 137. After Julian left with his two friends, Tisha asked the attending nurse why Julian was allowed into the room when he wasn't supposed to be there and the nurse rudely rudely answered back that she was just covering for the regular nurse and that she didn't know anything about it the nurse said she would call the social worker 138 Tisha then waited for the social worker but called her mom to let her know what was going on 139 when Jordy the social worker and he was gay when Jordy the social worker came to Shimei's room about five to ten minutes later he told Tisha and Paige that he didn't think it was a problem to allow Julian to see Shimei because there were people monitoring the situation. 140. Jordy also told Tisha and Paige that if Shimei didn't want anyone to see her, 
that it was that it would have to be Shimei who would have to say that for herself. Did you did you hear that? Jordy told Tisha that if Shimei didn't want anyone to see her, <coughs> she would have to tell that to them first before they wouldn't allow people in, even though they knew that she was severely brain damaged with liver, heart, lungs, everything was just rotten in terms of damage, severe damage. Lungs, heart, liver, brain. When was Shimei going to wake up and tell him anything? Shimei was dead. They knew it, but they were playing mind fuckery. Don't be gullible, people. What? Should Tisha have went there and started shaking on Shimei? Shimei, Shimei, wake up, wake up. They got Julian coming in here. You have to tell Jordy, the social worker, the gay one at that, that um, you, you don't want him and his friends coming in here looking at you because you know that you look like who knows what, but nothing that you want to be proud of, that's for sure. So you got to tell Jordy personally yourself that you don't want Julian in the bedroom. Shmei, wake up, wake up. How far do you think they would let her do that? If Shimei, if anyone went in there and started shaking, 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 shaking Shimei's body, her face would have fucking fell off, people. Nine hours. Oh my God. Then Paige asked Jordy to explain how Shimei could give permission if Shimei was unconscious. Jordy responded back with hum and did not answer the question. And this is who they have working at the Surrey Memorial Hospital. This is why I tell you some of these people that work in these hospitals are actors and are nothing more than actors. They are not professional doctors. They are not professional nurses. They are not, I guess you could say, professional social workers. They are actors to fi to, to, to facilitate a theatrical um, play just to convince you of something that so they can gain something in the back scene in terms of medically kidnapping Uncle John because they all got some sort of freaking bribe for that to happen. And then, of course, they must have got money for doting over a dead body for nine days, right? Because otherwise these people are complete idiots if they do this shit for free. Or maybe the, the robotoids that the government put out years ago in the millions that we're not aware of and they just look and act like us and this is why they're so uh, shallow with their, with, their, with their emotions and with their um, actions because they're soulless, right, right, with the synthetic bodies. The skinwalkers. They're either the skinwalkers people or they're getting paid to do this. And I don't know what kind of individual would go to school to become a nurse, to go into a public hospital to become a nurse after all the years of studying and, and then just settle to do shit like that to get a little extra money on their paycheck. Like, who does that? And then feel good about themselves when they go home as a nurse. What kind of nurse or social worker or doctor does this kind of stuff? Unless, of course, there's something physically and mentally wrong with those individuals that do this kind of stuff, like propping up dead bodies on hospital beds and just fucking mind fuckery with the family with, well, I don't know, I, I, I guess you have a point, but Shimei still didn't say that Julian couldn't go in there, so in my mind, in my opinion, it doesn't matter what your mom has to say because I'm the social worker, I make the decisions, so they can come in as much as they want. And then when my son found out about it, then that's when he went back to the hospital and he challenged them on it. And he recorded it, and then he ended up giving me the recording, and I'm like, oh, okay. And I put it up online, and I forward that to the lawyer, yeah, as a reference. 
<clears throat> as reference as to what my family has had to face because that wasn't the first time they did that shit with Uncle John when the kids went to fucking Victoria General Hospital in April after they met with kidnapped them and Eleanor Gilding called security on them and ran them out of there and almost got them arrested because they went there to go talk to John and she didn't want that because she knew that John wanted to come home to us Hmm. 139 when Jordy okay social worker 140 Jordy also told Tisha and Shmay okay we read that 141 then Paige asked Jordy to explain we read that 142 then Jordy told the girls that he was going to contact Judy and see if he could set up a visit for Julian when Shimei's family members were not there to avoid confrontation. No, it was the hospital staff that was creating the confrontation. They were more interested in protecting Julian's rights than they were in protecting Shimei's safety or the safety of her family and her friends. Okay? So now we're on page, what happened to page 17? Was that page 17 that I read? And this is probably pushing on a three hour video. Yeah, page 17, so I think we should stop now and come back later. So uh, it would be April 13th of 2018. Fraser Health Authority staff argue again, again, again to allow Julian into Shimei's room. Now they're arguing to allow him in. Again. What was so special about Julian? Oh, I know. He said that he was Shimei's common-law partner and that they were living together. Which was a lie. And he shaved his hair and said he got a job. He was working. Yeah. Yeah, the whole time you were with Shmay, couldn't get a fucking job after you hit your thumb with a hammer and said you couldn't work and went off and did all kinds of crazy bloody stupid shit. But on the day you murder my daughter, all of a sudden you're going to work. At a pot dispensary, that is. But the point is, I'm going to work. And then you shave your head to make yourself look like you were fucking whatever. Just stupid. Stupid crap. But why was the hospital fighting so hard for Julian and not for the family people? That's another clue. You know, when you go through it, you don't see it as a clue. But it's a clue. When you go through the Texas, and you don't clue in until five years later that the bastard was sitting under, under over there in the bush lying to his freaking text that he was miles away and it was on his way when in fact he was sitting there probably watching you for an hour without even you realizing you were being watched and that wouldn't be the first time Julian did that because you got his sister up on fucking YouTube and I'm gonna leave it on this note you got his sister up on YouTube with her stupid videos going on talking about how Julian and Cheeseburger, this is not going to last very long, how Julian and Cheeseburger used to sit back there in up in the alley, right, in, in my driveway, plotting and scheming how they were going to kill me, kill me, literally fucking kill me, to take Amari away from me, okay, as they're sitting out there watching and plotting and scheming.